All right, so we're really, really lucky again to have Bill Dare with us. Uh, he's one of our affiliate members. He is a veteran home inspector and um, he really knows his craft well, so much so that uh, he's an expert witness in lawsuits when they happen to go to court. So he has seen it from both being up on the ladder as well as being up on the stand. And with that comes a whole lot of knowledge, a whole lot of experience. And the really cool thing about today's presentation, we're going to get into some Philadelphia specific things with some of the housing stock that you guys deal with day in and day out. So with that, um, Bill, good morning. Welcome. We're so happy to have you. That's awesome. Thank you, Matt, for having me on board. It's great to see all you people here to get out and, uh, well, not literally get out, but uh, get on the screen. I'm excited to go through the presentation. Um, Matt and I were talking a little bit in the beginning um, about the, the, the unique situation that we find ourselves in the last year with the market being as uh, zenith hot as it is, where um, buyers are being challenged in ways to try to get a property that they couldn't get. Um, they probably missed several offers and, and they, so they're now they're telling their agent, I need to find a way to make sure that this deal goes through. As far as we're concerned, one of the things that seems to be impacting the industry is the um, waiving inspections. Um, and uh, I don't believe that that's a, an intelligent move. I don't think it's wise. I understand the pressures for it. Um, and certainly it's impacted our business from a standpoint of um, how many inspections that we're doing on a on a regular basis is down about 40%. Um, and so we have seven guys in the field. We're doing anywhere from a typical year, 10 to 12 inspections a day. And so you can imagine that, uh, that that's been a big impact and that's true across the board. I'm in touch with a lot of different home inspectors. So uh, that impact is on me. The impact that's on you is how do you challenge, how are you challenged to get the place that you wanna get without giving up the farm and that's where a good agent comes in and says okay so we, there are some strategies we can use but waiving inspections has turned into this disaster that is um the full breadth of it is still working its way through the system uh, according to par the uptick in calls to the legal hotline about the failure to disclose is up 40 percent um and as Matt said, I get involved in a lot of these from a consultation standpoint or from an actual expert witness where I get called. I just did a case um, that was brought against a home inspector, not one of my guys, but another guy. Um, so, you know, you get to you get to see how the lawyers dissect the process. And what I will tell you is that everybody will remember this transaction differently when the lawyers get involved. So it'll have, you know, you will have as a listing agent, you will have known all this for sure, even though you probably didn't, the seller knew it all. And you were, you made them take this deal without an inspection, which caused them harm. So we want to try to avoid that if we can. So there's a couple of strategies and we're going to get into a PowerPoint here that we specifically prepared for today. But um, Matt, and I thought this was a good conversation to open up with. The strategies, and there's some of this in this PowerPoint, but the strategies are if, rather than waive the inspection, can you raise, can your buyer say, I'll accept 10,000, 15, 20, whatever thousand dollars worth of issues rather than just waive it all together? Because we're not really trying to save your buyer from a $1,500 problem. We're trying to save them from a $100,000 problem or a $50,000 problem. And to the extent that this is impacting low end buyers is really where my heart is at on this. If, and a lot of what we deal with is millionaires, silly millionaires, and those people are going to still vacation in the south of France. It's not going to change their retirement date. They're going to do whatever they're going to do, and this just is just them suing each other. It's the it's the single mom or the the newly married couple that scratched together three hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars to buy their first house, who who had to waive the inspection theoretically to get it, and now they get in there and they find the roof doesn't work it's leaking, the heater doesn't work right, the air conditioning doesn't, you know, whatever the situation is, now they've got thousands of dollars to spend that they can't afford. The other thing they can't afford is the $10,000 retainer to go get a lawyer to go after the seller. So they're stuck. So that's really the marketplace that I think is being decimated to some extent um, in this process where they're getting these houses on, uh, without knowing. So we put in a new process where we'll do a, what we call a walk and talk 
um, you know, during a showing, we'll, we'll walk your customer through it in a showing slot um, to try to at least get something. It's not a home inspection by any stretch of your imagination, but it's at least something that you can talk to an inspector. We can take a bunch of pictures and we can even have a conference call after. So there are some strategies. So raising the bar on what you'll accept on a home inspection, um, inspecting for informational purposes only, uh, some limitations on that. And, and so there's some things that you can do in an attempt to try to get your deal accepted that, um, you know, that, that will help at least keep the inspection process in play. I'm gonna share my screen here. So I'm gonna get into this PowerPoint um, and, uh, Let's see, there we go. This should bring up a screen with um, with the slideshow on it. Are we good there, Matt? We're good? Okay, good. All right, so again, appreciate the, the opportunity to be here with GPAR. I live out in the boondocks where, you know, I can't see my neighbors. Uh, there's, I can park seven cars in my driveway. Uh, it's just, just not stuff that you guys are typically accustomed to in Philadelphia. And it took a while for, for me and my company to get comfortable with Philly. We've been doing this for nearly 20 years now, and we've been in Philly for almost all of that. So, but it, it hasn't, it has been entertaining to watch the process of Philly, um, you know, in the, in the inspection process and the real estate process, things have changed a lot. The, um, me, I'm Bill Dare. I've been doing this, like I said, for a long time. I, I own Spotlight Home Inspection. We just renamed the stucco part of our inspection to Spotlight Building Science. Um, that's where we do building envelope evaluations and uh, forensic testing for lawyers and insurance companies. Um, so that has to do with all the buildings. So all my guys, every one of my inspectors are certified for building envelope. They don't necessarily work in that realm. But I want all my guys, because we're known for that, I, all my guys should be able to have a very intelligent conversation about what's happening on the outside of the house with sidings, stucco, stone, uh, cement board siding, vinyl, things like that. So all my guys are certified as building envelope um, inspectors through the Exterior Design Institute. I love what I do. I do this for nothing, but I don't have to. Um, so I've been always passionate about the home inspection business. I found this when I was 45. Um, I'm now you know, far older than that but uh, you can do the math. And the, uh, you know, I think that it's been the love of my life to take people from, and, and the same thing goes for you as agents. You take people from a situation they really don't wanna be in, homeless, living at home with their parents, living in a small house and moving them into a nicer house. You're changing their lives. This is basically life-changing stuff. So I've enjoyed everything about that process um, in, in getting to know, um, all of our agents and the associations that we deal with. What makes a great inspection? And this is true across the board, whether it's Philadelphia or, or in the suburbs. Um, I think your inspector, well, I know your inspector should be well-dressed and on time, um, you know, showing up with, with jeans and, and, uh, and sneakers and stuff is just not a good image. Uh, I read a book once um, that talked about you have 20 seconds to make a first impression within the first 20 seconds of somebody meeting you, they're going to decide whether or not they're going to do business with you or not. Well, and I thought that was really entertaining that, that, you know, that things tend to happen that quick. Um, you should engage the clients. Um, our inspectors are, uh, we tried for a long time to do reports on site. I would love to have been able to do that, um, but it doesn't play out well. Um, I want our inspector to engage the clients. So the inspector should, and this is true just of every inspector that you deal with, they should set the expectations. I think most people think that inspectors can see through walls and predict the future and, and all this. And I, th I think that's important for the inspector right at the beginning. We start all of our inspections at the kitchen table and discuss what it is that they can do and what they can't do. Um, they should encourage interaction and questions. We love people to ask questions. In fact, we're gonna tell you that and uh, to stay with us. And if something doesn't seem right, stop us and ask us about it. If you think we missed something, ask us. And encouraging uh, questions and interaction is huge. We want the client to feel totally engaged in this. And I think that's part of any good home inspection. Knows what to say, and honestly, this is really important. Is that is how to say it? How you deliver anything, whether it's in the report, which is going to go to the seller, and you can't alienate the buyer and the seller by having an overly um, nitpicky report, um, but you need to know how to put that to the client. Again, we're going to talk a little bit later about how to stop an inspection that's going off the rails, 
um, if the inspector is not saying things the way that they should be saying. So we're trying to always keep the, um, the client engaged. It's as much an education about the house. So we really want the people to understand how to change the filter and the air conditioning and heating system, how to turn off the water, how to turn off the electrical main breaker and things like that, and, and answer any questions about maintenance on the outside. Um, I think this is huge. You're gonna all get my cell phone number at the end of this. Um, I think that this is a team game. Everybody needs a good team. Um, you need to have the ability to contact people just like GPAR is here for you to help educate you and help give you information and, um, and documents and PAR is the same. So all these things are here in place to help you and we wanna be that help. So um, you know, having the ability to reach out and, and con connect directly with me, whether it be with a photograph of something you don't understand at a walkthrough you're doing or anything, just shoot it to me. That's all I do. I don't really get in the field too much anymore other than illegal work, but I'm always available to try to help you guys get you to the finish line. We want you to go to the closing table and they should manage their time wisely. It, you cannot do a home inspection in less than two hours unless it's a tiny condo. It just takes two hours at least. And some of the stuff we do, we we had one recently. We had seven guys on the on the site, and it still took us five and a half hours. But it was you know thirteen thousand square feet, five buildings. <clears throat> it was a lot. So, but we need to manage our time as inspectors and and take whatever time we. It should not seem rushed. The client should always feel that they that the inspector took whatever time was necessary, and they should be inspecting a home and be amazing at it. That just goes without saying. Um, any home inspector should be able to describe anything that they come across in a house. It's rare for any of my guys to see something they haven't seen many times before. And if there is something you need to be able to just take a picture and say, let me get back to you on that. Every once in a while, we see something really kind of goofy. So being a great inspector has a lot to do with experience, um, what, you've, what you've done over the past. So um, you know, if you're gonna be looking for a home inspector, uh, you should ask for a copy of the report, what they're, you know, how long they've been in the business, how many houses they've inspected. I stopped counting at 10,000 just because it got a little boring. But, um, you know, experience is a real critical piece to this. Where the inspector needs to get to. Well, a lot of Philly houses don't have an attic, right? The, the ceiling is attached right to the underside of the roof framing. But if there's an attic, we want to get in the attic. <coughs> Excuse me. We want to get to the heaters, water heater, electric panel. If there's a crawl space that we can get into in Philly, a lot of the, a lot of the basements are like half the size of the house and in the back was a porch or something that got enclosed into the kitchen. That's kind of unique to Philly and some of the um, other uh, Norristown and, and Conchahokan where the, the kitchens got um, pushed out into the porch. So you can't really get underneath of those, but in a crawl space that we can get into, we certainly want to be able to do that. The, um, who should attend? Now, this is lovely. I don't know how you can control this as a real estate agent, but um, if if we're doing a pre-listing inspection, which I think are huge, and it's a huge liability release for the listing agent um, to get us between or any inspector between the, the the buyer and the seller. So instead of the buyer having to be upset with the um, the, the seller of the house or the listing agent, they can call us and complain about it because we did the full inspection for the house. So they got a copy of the report before they ever had to put an offer in. If it's all possible, the buyer should always attend the inspection. We think that that's huge. Um, there's so much information that's given and so many opportunities to answer questions. So that's something we definitely want to, we want the buyer to be there if at all possible. Um, you know, as, as interesting as this is, I don't know how you say this to somebody, but bringing kids and animals um, to a home inspection is kind of creates a, a difficult situation. Um, you're a guest in somebody else's house. I've had people, kid banging with their fists on baby grand pianos and uh, animals running around. And it's just now with video, everything's being videotaped, right? The ring doorbell has video on it. So the seller of the house is kind of halfway watching a lot of times what's actually happening in their house. So just try to remember that if you're the buyer's agent and you're in there for a showing or whatever, there's a chance that you're being videotaped and people are listening to you. So have all your conversations outside away from the doorbell um, and uh, your situation will be greatly improved. The key items that we're going to expect. Well, one of the biggies is a roof. Um, I think that, uh, 
the roofing on, on a house in Philly is challenging. A lot of the times it's difficult to get up there. Um, we have every one of my guys has a drone. Your inspector should have a drone if he can't get on the roof or, or she can't get on the roof for some reason. Um, but roofing is a huge issue. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the Philly specific stuff here in a minute. So I'll wait for that. Siding and windows and doors. So we're going to look at the mortar intrusion behind the siding potential for that. The windows operation, the doors, so, you know, do they lock and latch? Grading and drainage and downspouts. This is a little bit more outside of Philly. Um, Philadelphia, a lot of what you guys are dealing with was just sidewalks and patios. And you're allowed to drop your, your uh, gutters into the, the stormwater management system, which is really a, a, a unique, unique situation. So there's basically, it gets dumped into the sewer line for the most part. So you can get rid of water. Electric panels, wiring outlets, which is older houses had a lot of challenging um, wiring. If you if you think about houses, we think of them in age brackets. So anything built in the last 30 years, we're not dealing with very many electrical problems unless Uncle Buck showed up to, to do something. But if it's original wiring, it's not usually problematic. Um, back in the 40s and 50s, we had a lot of cloth. There wasn't a lot built in the 30s, obviously, because of the Depression. Um, there's some aluminum wiring in the 40s and 50s and even 60s. Um, and then before that, back in the, anything allowed, and this goes to a lot of Philadelphia stock, stuff that was built at the turn of the century in the early 1900s um, had knob and tube, which is uh, hugely problematic today. It ran its course. It, it's not accepted pretty much anymore. These, a lot of insurance companies won't insure a house with knob and tube wiring. Um, I'm going to leave some time for questions, I hope anyway. So if, you, if anything pops up, just shoot, a, shoot me a text or an email later. I'm happy to answer it or we may have an opportunity to do that on, on camera here. Um, visible components of the framing. A lot of times in the basement, we can see the floor framing. Um, we do pre-drywall inspections for new construction, so we can see a lot of the framing at that point. Um, safety is obviously a huge concern for us. Uh, railings, handrails, trip hazards, ground fault circuit interrupt which is the little outlets with little buttons and bathrooms and kitchens. Um, attic installation, insulation and ventilation, if we can get there. And uh, siding installation issues such as stucco, which is a huge problem in the city of Philadelphia, stucco, veneer stone. Um, the, refail, the fail rate on stucco installed in the last 25 years in Philadelphia is very high. Um, I used to say be able to say 100% because there was not a single stucco house that I had seen in Philadelphia that didn't have damage behind the stucco, but we have found a few recently um, that were built a little bit more recently. So we're, you know, hope is high that we can get out of that, that trend in Philly. Possible additional inspections. So besides the home inspection or pre-listing inspection, which those are the same, it's just one's done for the seller in advance of putting it on the market and one's done for the buyer, obviously. Uh, wood destroying uh, wood destroying insect, which is commonly called a termite inspection, but honestly, you're looking for powder post beetles, um, termites, carpenter ants, carpenter bees. Um, there is some discussion about moving to a wood destroying organism inspection, which is going to include um, mold and wood rot, but they haven't done that yet, as far as I know. Radon testing. Um, radon in the city is kind of hit or miss. I'd say it's it's less likely in the city than in the suburbs. Um, but it still exists, but it's not on as high a percentage basis per capita. Water testing um, in the city, again, we're dealing with uh, public water. Um, there are some people that are really OCD like me that would test the water anyway. Um, on the outside chance, there's lead pipes out in the water mains and things that they can't see, but water testing is something we do. Um, again, this is more of a outside of the city, the well flow and depth septic. There's not too many houses in the city that have septic. Um, moisture evaluation behind cladding, commonly called a stucco inspection. We call it a building envelope because it can include stucco, stone, uh, cement board, vinyl. Those are specific inspections that generally your home inspector is gonna call for if he sees something that he doesn't feel is, is, is okay on the home inspection, he can amp up the inspection and call for an invasive inspection. Mold, air quality, um, we got into this just because I got so tired of the mold guys blowing up my real estate transactions. So mold and air quality, people call me and say, can we get a mold inspection? I want to know if there's mold in my house. And they, um, the answer is yes, there's mold in your house. Um, it's everywhere. You can't get rid of it. Um, but it's not something 
um, that, that we're going to necessarily get worried about unless it's actually growing in the house. And pool inspections, hot tubs, things like that. So some things unique to Philadelphia. Rooftop decks, now this is, goes to kind of newer construction. I've got some photographs of some of the stuff after these slides, which are really entertaining to me as a home inspector, maybe not so much to you, but draining the water away. So um, un, unbeknownst to apparently every contractor in the state of Phil, in the city of Philadelphia, um, the, the roof drain is called a scupper and they're required by code to have a backup scupper. Especially if you have a rooftop deck, there's going to be stuff up there that could could wash into the scupper and block the water from getting off the roof. <clears throat> and to get onto the roof, you need a doorway, which is usually called a pilot house that comes up onto the roof. And I'm sorry, but if you get three or four inches of root water on that roof, now you have a water feature because it just ran in the door and it's going down the steps. So having a backup scupper is really a big thing. So when you look at the drainage on a roof, you should see not only the basic scupper, there should be a secondary pipe close by that allows, um, in case that gets blocked, that it still drains. Um, that's something we point out on very uh, high degree, high number of, of um, roof inspections. The rooftop railings, um, we've seen some really, I mean, think about this. In most cases, you're three or four stories off the sidewalk. And some of these railings that, that get put up on these rooftop decks, particularly ones that were added to an older house, are downright scary. So safety is a real big thing. Um, ironically, sewer vents are challenging. When you have a rooftop deck, you are required to have um, ventilate your sewer lines out through the roof. Um, so it's always entertaining to see how they're gonna, so a lot of times you have a six or a seven foot high pipe sticking up because um, if it's lower than that, you tend to smell it when you're sitting on the, sitting on a rooftop deck. I don't know what it is about Philadelphia, but, you guys are lo in love with horizontal handrails. So the, the balusters are not mounted vertically, they're mounted horizontally, which makes them climbable, which under no circumstances has ever been okay in a building code. But in Philadelphia, it's routine. We see it all the time. So if you have young ones at, on the property, you need to take some particular attention to that. Generally, we recommend if you're not gonna change the railing, which is cost prohibitive, you can zip tie on, some uh, some plexiglass or something that can prevent them from climbing until they get old enough to, to understand that climbing up the railing and falling over is not a good plan. Now you can always take my dad's view on raising kids and just let them climb and fall over because that was his thing. He'd be like, let them fall, they'll only do it once. So, but generally speaking, we want to try to prevent injury. Um, new construction next to hundred year old houses. Now this is something that's just rampant through Philly. Um, and it's, it's a huge concern of ours and some of it we can't address once it's already built. Um, I get called in on a, a lot of new construction stuff where people are building next to their house. I'm gonna have a picture of that later. And they're unhappy with the way things are going. So they, they call me to come out and look at the, the new house going up to their house. Um, and so it's, it's problematic. Um, they're gonna tear down the wall. And in Philly, these row houses were built to rely on each other. So there's, you know, six, seven, 10 houses in a row and a wall between them is called a party wall. And that wall had flooring that tied the wall in from right to left, from side to side. And when you take the other house away, we've lost that support or that additional support. So uh, a lot of times there's some additional framing or <clears throat> some tie-ins that need to happen. So that, that connection is, is difficult. The next thing that we can see a lot of times is the roof connection to the from the old house to the new house is always entertaining. Um, it's almost never done well because the, the people putting up the new house don't really care about the old house. And so and, and a lot of times I think they're they're feeling that it won't be long before that old house is torn down and another new one is built up right next to it. But the roof connections are something that we're going to inspect pretty diligently. Depending on if we're in the old house or the new house, um, you know, it'll, it'll change how we feel about things. Um, we can check things with thermal cameras and moisture meters to see if water's getting in. But that roof connection is always, is always fun. The party wall has to be fire rated. Now, in the city of Philadelphia, which you guys have had the fire code, um, thanks to Ben Franklin, for an awful long time, 
Um, it was the first city to have such a code. So the, the fire separation between houses has been something indicative in the construction process. So most of the houses that, that exist in Philadelphia, that brick party wall between the houses is a great fire separator. New construction, the party, the party wall has to be designed to be fire rated. And it gets challenging because when you build a new house next to an old house, that party wall is gonna extend up beyond, typically beyond the old roof. And that fire separation needs to continue on up all the way to the roof of the new house. Because if that old house catches on fire, that fire is gonna go right up the side of the building. So party wall fire rating is always um, something that we're challenged to try to figure out if we can see it. Um, and then foundation is like, again, I got a really good picture of this because they're digging a new foundation next to an old foundation. And, and that always creates challenges and sometimes it's not done very well. Construction in Philly. Um, if you've got a great contractor in Philly that'll return your call and show up and do a job, take them to lunch, kudos to you. It's difficult to find a good contractor that actually does a good job that isn't booked out two and a half years right now in the city of Philadelphia. Um, the cost of construction is um, amazingly higher in Philadelphia, and that has to do a lot with um, constraints. Uh, it's difficult to get a dumpster into Philadelphia anywhere to so get rid of stuff. There's no place for them to park their trucks. Like everything is challenging. I was involved in a litigation case uh, on a stucco problem in Philadelphia. And the, the, the cost to repair this house was three times what it would cost to do it out in the suburbs. And the lawyers on the case were very upset about this. And I said, well, we'll, all, we'll be happy to reduce the price of this stucco, but you guys all have to show up with five gallon buckets because every bit of debris coming off of this house is to be bucketed out a block and a half to where they could actually put a dumpster to get rid of it all. And they didn't really want to do that. So they, they went ahead and settled the case. So it's really difficult to to construct in Philly a lot of times. So the cost of construction when you're estimating has to be higher in Philly. Zip wall, I got a picture of this if you don't know what that is. That's that big green um, plywood, or it's actually OSB, right in strand board, that's being put up all over the city. It's a very decent system. I don't, I'm not a hugely in love with it, but it, it's a system, so it has to be installed properly. And um, uh, I have yet to see it installed properly, ever. Not just in the city of Philadelphia, ever. So um, we, we have to be mindful of, of how things get installed. Egress is always a challenge in Philly. Where are you gonna, you know, if you're gonna do a finished basement, we really want you to have a means of egress, a secondary means of egress, you know, and that's always a challenge because the backyards are so small. You can't really go out on the front sidewalk. Um, Safety is always a concern as far as people getting in. So egress is always a, a challenging. And then gentrification. Um, this was not even a term not that long ago, as far as I know. It's only something that came to me in the last few years. But the whole gentrification is, is a process. Um, obviously, if you're in Philly, you're familiar with where the, the lower income or less expensive housing is getting replaced with higher end housing, which costs a lot more money that the people in that neighborhood um, can't really afford. So it creates this potentially troubling dynamic between the people that still live in the neighborhood that didn't cash out yet and the people that are moving in. Um, so I've got a map of this um, in a minute. It shows you, it talks to you about it a little bit. So Philly has some challenges. Um, these are some of the top ones that I think I, that came to mind. Um, uh, rooftop decks, I, I mentioned. Uh, this, I can tell you this because there's three of them and they're basically identical. This is across the street from Bessie Ross's house. This is like a $2.4 million townhouse. Um, yes, that's a roof. Um, 12 inches below that is the actual roof. And yes, that's a hot tub in the left corner. Um, there was seating up there. Um, so this, you don't see this outside of Philadelphia. Why do you see in Philly? Because there's not room to put a backyard. So you're trying to move the yard up onto the roof. So this was an inner, this is when I was on a couple of years ago, um, the inspection. And yes, this is an extension of that. Now we've got basically a, a sink up there, which creates plumbing challenges for the, for the owner in the wintertime. That all has to be winterized. You've got a grill up there. You've got granite countertop or marble countertops. This is all on one roof. Um, so I can't really even see the roof because those panels that you see that you're walking on are sitting on 12 inch high standoff. So 
below all that is the roof and the drainage and all that. So this is all unique to Philadelphia. Um, we just don't see this anywhere else in our region. This is a foundation issue. The house that you're looking at was one that I was involved in um, during the original construction, um, not long after, um, as is typically going to be the case. Now, the, 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 the house that was next to it um, was torn down to build the house that we're looking at. And then somebody decided to build a house up against this um, the, the newer house. If you look at the bottom of this, below, so you see the vinyl siding, then you see the, the poured foundation for the newer house that, that is already built. And then you see these square blocks. Well, that's a theoretical attempt at underpinning because see, if you see, they dug down past the foundation. You're not allowed to do that. There's a hypothetical 45 degree line that extends out from the foundation that you can't disturb that um, when you dig down past it, it, it disrupts the the, the support that the soil is having for the, the existing foundation. So this was a complete disaster. Engineers were called out. Uh, the city was called out. This turned into a, a very big deal. And this was because it's right next to the river. The first house was not permitted to have a basement. The next house was not permitted to have a basement, but they were trying to sneak one in. So this was being dug down so they could get a basement in underneath of this house. So this is, this is hugely challenging. And this is something that's fairly unique to the city of Philadelphia. So digging down past the quarters is always a problem. Now, at a typical home inspection, you're not gonna be able to see this directly, but we can look for signs if we have um, cracking in the floor, cracking in foundations. So these are things that we can, we can look at to try to help deduce whether or not there's structural issues and movement. This is Zipwall Huber Systems uh, put this out. This has been widely used in the city and, uh, and other places. Um, it's uh, the black lines are tape that seal up the seams. The tape has to be rolled. It's never rolled. I've never even seen a roller on a job. I remember this is all I do is wander around construction sites and ask for their zip roller when it's zip wall. Um, I have honest to Pete, I have yet to see a zip roller on a job site. I have one in my truck just so I can show them what it looks like. Um, it's got the house wrap theoretically built. That green is a phenolic finish on there that is the is technically replacing the house wrap in many cases. Now in this particular case, they were doing a secondary layer of tieback on top of it, which I kind of like. I don't really trust the tape to do its job as well as they, they like it to be, but that zip wall, um, and it's, uh, it has its own challenges for installation. And I think the biggest challenge is the contractor thinks it's going to, thinks it's going to solve all their really poor installation um, <laughs> installation processes. So that's what zip wall is. Who knew there was a map of gentrification as I was doing, getting ready for this. Um, I was like, wow, there's actually a map on this. Um, there's a couple of them. Some of them didn't look as nice as this, so I could pick this one, but some of them actually give you the, the percentages of houses that are being um, torn down and rebuilt. So this gives you an idea of what's happening in the city um, as far as where things are turning over. I guess if you're a real estate agent and you want to, you had a buyer that wanted to buy in the, the red area, the non-gentrified area or the gray area, it would be entertaining to look and see how close to that blue area you are because that's what's happening, right? The bands of gentrification are expanding out. Um, nobody's going to build right in the center of the gray area. Um, a new construction very often is going to be more that's going to be abutted to a, an already approved area and it's going to keep expanding out. This is back to typical home inspections. Moisture in a crawl space or a basement are a huge problem even in the city of Philadelphia. Um, Downspouts that are disconnected and dropping right at the foundation are, are always problematic. So we, you know, this is part of a good inspection. It's gonna to talk to you about uh, moisture intrusion um, and look for signs of it. The, the can of Ridex was always entertaining there in the, in the crawl space. Mold mildew um, is in older houses in particular um, is pretty much a big problem. The, the left picture is up in an attic. Um, if you have an attic that's not well ventilated and a lot of humidity in the house, you'll get condensation on the roof deck, which will uh, support mold growth. The other is, I don't know whoever thought it was a good idea to put wood um, paneling in a basement, but that's wood paneling in a basement. So the first 
order of business is to uh, address the moisture problem first before you start thinking about the mold. And a good resource is the EPA's website, epa.gov slash mold. They say in there, you don't need to hire a crew. You can clean it up yourself with soap and water. They don't really support bleach. They, they want you to use soap and water. So if you've got a client that's selling a house that has some mold problems, um, you know, it may not be necessary to hire a big professional crew. They may be able to follow the EPA's guidelines on cleaning it up themselves. This is on the back of sheetrock. We see this a lot more on newer construction where down at the bottom of that wall there, you see that black stuff. And then all the way, almost to the top of the picture, you see it turns to yellow. Uh, mold is very colorful. Um, mostly it's the color of green, which is called money going out the door trying to deal with it. So deal with the moisture in the basement. Um, and that's the first order line of business. If it's on sheetrock, from my perspective, um, the sheetrock has to go in the trash. Um, it's too difficult. You can't really clean that. There are some paints. Uh, Zinzer makes a mold killing primer that they declare you can paint right over it and, uh, and it's good to go. Uh, Foster's 4020 is another that covers mold, but I, I want to use that more on framing. Drywall, I think, should just be thrown away, but that's a personal choice. This is the underside of a, this you'll see a lot in Philly. This is old pine tongue and groove flooring. Um, the green stuff in about the middle of the picture was almost certainly in that wood when it was installed. That didn't grow there since the house was built. That wood was stacked up and, and got wet and the mold grew in there before the wood was ever put down. On the floor joist to the right and left is a little bit of white mold, probably aspergillus or penicillin, one of the more common molds. That did grow there since the humidity control was not good in the house. So these are all things that you should see on a home inspection that, that the inspector should be able to discuss and de-escalating de the conversation into, hey, go look at the website for the EPA and, and deal with it the way they say to do it. Don't just call in a, a mold abatement. There are some places where I think that's necessary. Um, that's where I think it's necessary. That's a big mold problem. You can't deal with that yourself. That's basically gutting, the, that's in a basement. That was a bank owned. You can see the actual line in the, in the drywall about two feet up. That's where the water was. Um, so uh, the bank turned off the electric, which was brilliant. So that turned off the sump pump. Um, under sinks is a really big area we find a lot of times, especially if the drain leaked and stuff. So there's a little bit of mold under sinks a lot of the time. So these are just some of the places we find. Um, missing in wide balusters is a big problem. So this is some of the more common things we're going to see on a home inspection. Um, and again, it has to do with your inspector de-escalating the, you know, don't ratchet up the pressure. There's enough pressure in the transaction already. Uh, balusters that are more than four inches apart or we talked about this mounted horizontally, loose railings, loose toilets, loose sinks, loose steps. Missing anti-tip devices on a range. So ranges are required to be, have a bracket in the back that keeps them from tipping over in case the kids decide to get up on the counter by stepping on the, the oven door. Um, you don't have a ton of garage doors, but amazingly every garage door we seem to see the the photo eyes to keep it from coming down on something are misadjusted. Occasionally I see them taped together and just up on the ceiling. So that's an important safety device. Uh, it's fairly easily fixed. Missing outdated smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. Uh, smoke detectors only have a 10 year life cycle. Um, after 10 years, they're supposed to be thrown away and bought, purchase new ones. I love the new ones now that have 10 year batteries built into them. So you throw them up on the ceiling when they start beeping, you throw them in the trash and put up a new one. That's amazing. You don't have to change out the batteries every, every twice a year. And they have those for um, hardwired one as well. Um, I'm trying to bust through this a little bit because we're behind. Decks, decks and Philly are entertaining. I'm not sure where the deck construction crews got to in the city of Philadelphia, but they didn't go to any classes. Um, they, uh, securing the deck to the house is hugely important. Um, and deck failure is fast and catastrophic. Um, every year we seem to have a few. Uh, so we wanna, a good inspection is gonna look really hard at that way the deck is attached to the house. Um, and the, the support should be straight up and down. And in Philly, a lot of the row houses, the garage is in like downhill into the garage and then the deck is built out over the garage. And that's always um, 
uh, entertaining to see how the car is going to hit the support post for the deck as they were as you're coming in on a Friday night that you probably shouldn't have been driving. So all that stuff is a good conversation piece for the client um, when they when you're going through this with a home inspection. This this uh, slideshow is um, not, besides being recorded, um, they have the uh, they have the presentation um, in PDF. So if you want a copy of it, you can go back through it later. Missing cover plates, which again are super easy to fix, but are safety hazards, particularly for kids. Loose outlets, out that wiring, we talked about knob and tube, missing GFCIs, um, the ground fault circuit interrupts, which are, which are the outlets with little buttons. Uncovered lights in closets are a big problem in Philly and, and everywhere else too, in older houses. Um, the problem is that I don't know what your closets look like, but if they look like mine and you forget to turn the light off, you know, the stuff that you have shoved in there might be up against a hot light bulb. And we don't want to start a fire. Windows and doors goes without saying. We should be checking windows, doors, fog panes. It's, uh, if you have a failed seal, um, it looks like it's raining inside the window when it gets really bad. But initially, it's just out of focus, seems like. And that's just moisture getting in between the panes of glass. Um, we, we don't ever want to have to use a key to get out of the house. Um, I'm getting out of the house no matter what. But your five-year-old may not. So. Um, we generally not supposed to use a double lock cylinder. You should have a, a just a regular thumb turn, thumb turn. So that's a safety issue for us. It's not it's not legal anymore to to need a key to get out of the house. Peeling paint. Um, if your house is built before '78, theoretically, um, it may contain lead. Uh, I'll tell you that '78 there, there wasn't much lead paint being used in the '60s and '50s. It was much more prevalent than before. It was expensive. The lead actually made the paint much more durable. Um, and there was a period of time where we were telling you to got to get the lead paint off. Nowadays, we just want to keep it in good shape. So paint that's peeling, it needs to just be cleaned up and painted um, so it's in good shape. We don't want kids being able to contact it and get it on their fingers. I, there was some discussion about kids eating paint chips. I couldn't get my kids to eat anything but a chicken nugget. So I don't know how you got to eat paint chips, but. Um, you know, it's something we want to pay attention to. Rotted or deteriorated wood trim, loose siding. Sometimes peeling paint on siding is an indication of water getting behind there. So this is all stuff we're going to look at on the exterior of a house. Termites is always entertaining. It's not quite as big a deal as in Philadelphia it is. Those are those brown things look like strings. That's termite tubes. Those are some really determined termites. They're trying to find someplace else to be. So termites are something we're going to be looking for, powder post beetles, carpenter ants, that's, that's like structural damage. Um, you know, this guy had to have a light right there, which meant he cut framing to get the light, but nobody did anything to, to deal with it. Now, a good home inspector is not going to just tell you that they structurally altered the house and this is a problem. We're going to tell you that that's probably only about a $300 fix, right? We need to send a carpenter up there. He can bridge that. He can, he can scab another one on the side of it. And so we're going to, you know, any good inspector should be calibrating your problem so that your client, because your client's going to look at that and go, well, that's, that, that could probably know that you got to tear the house down. So structural damage is also some, something we're always looking at and something that a good inspector is going to throttle um, the data to the, to the buyer, particularly to try to help, um, help get them to adapt to the, what's going to fit, what's next. Who gets the report? Um, I, my wife had her birthday this past weekend and we were away um, trying to celebrate her birthday and some bank got a hold of my cell phone number and would not let me go because somebody had given them a copy of a stucco report and they wanted all kinds of data because they don't give your bank anything. Please don't give them a home inspection report. Don't give them a stucco report. There's a confidentiality it's in, inherent in our process. Um, so the, the home inspection company is only allowed to release the report to the client. And in our case, it's in the contract that the client's agent. If, the, if we're working for a buyer and a seller calls or the seller's agent calls, we will not give them a copy. Now, they are entitled to a copy um, at no cost based on the agreement that the PAR agreement but not based on us. So it would have to come from you. Um, but just don't give the appraiser. There's no reason for them to have this stuff. And, you know, every bank wants a, 
lend money on something that's flawless and there's just aren't any flawless houses. I told you I'd give you a little bit on how to stop something that's going off the rails. So if you're a listing agent um, and you feel the inspection is, is going crazy, um, A, I think you should always attend a home inspection with your client, especially when you're the buyer's agent. Um, you'll better understand the concerns that they have. You'll be able to ask questions of your own. And when you see the report, it won't be a mystery to you. <clears throat> if you're on an inspection for your client, it's not us. If it's me, I'm going to give you my number. You call me and I'll and we'll take care of it. But if you feel the inspector is being too hard on a house, delivering a message without good bedside manner, ask politely if he or she sees this often. Rarely does a home inspector see something in a house that they haven't seen multiple times in the last few weeks. So, uh, you know, if they're being very difficult about something and talking about something that exists at the end of the world, you could politely ask them, do you see this often? Oh yeah, I see this all the time. Okay, so it's not something that's just unique to this house. So you're just ratcheting back the pressure from the home inspector that may not be adequately prepared to deliver the information. Um, ask if they have an opinion to the urgency and potential cost. There's a lot of problems with houses and some of them don't have to be fixed all that quick. You just gotta know that sooner or later you're gonna have to take care of this. And then ask the inspector to opine on what do you think the cost may be? Again, you're just trying to give your client some, some perspective here. Um, and don't contradict the inspector. If they're wrong, that's their issue. If you're wrong, that's one of the biggest cases I ever heard about was a, 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 a real estate agent said that the inspector was incorrect and the client accepted the explanation of the real estate agent and the, it wasn't, <laughs> the inspector wasn't wrong. So the real estate agent got sued, the broker got sued. Um, there was a, it was a big mess. So don't contradict them. Just let them do their thing. If need be, send me their report. I'll talk to you about it. If, you know, if it really gets hectic, we can, we can get involved. But uh, I would say don't contradict the inspector. Let them hang on their own noose. Ask the inspector to help set expectations. If he's not doing this at the beginning of the inspection, say, hey, can, can, you know, can you help us understand what it is you're going to look at, how you're going to look at it? Um, and ask them if they've ever seen a perfect house. Again, this is for something that's going off the rails. If the inspection is going great, sit back and enjoy the ride. But if the inspection seems like it's going off the rails, then these are some things that you can do to kind of de-escalate the situation, hopefully, because no inspector has seen a perfect house. If I ever see one, I'm buying it myself. Um, hit us up on Facebook and, and uh, I don't know all these things. I'm old, but uh, Twitter and YouTube, and I don't know, we got a bunch of stuff out there. Um, all the stuff that we put out there is for you to use too. So you can co-market, um, put it in your, you know, put it out there. Um, this is a thing I did on a blog. I did on the high cost of low maintenance. Uh, everybody gets uh, thinking they're not going to pay for the maintenance and, but eventually you're going to pay for it. Um, this is a summary of kind of what we talked about. That's my cell phone number down there. If you want to make a note of that, please don't call that number and ask to schedule an inspection. That's what the office number is for. That's the 0505 number at the bottom. Um, but if you're running into a jam, if you've got something that's coming on glued, or if you see something that you're worried about, shoot me a text. I, this is all I do all day is answer phone calls and take, take text messages. And, and we want to be um, a, a good resource for GPAR, the members of GPAR. We, we're thrilled to be a member and really want to um, give you the ability to have somebody to step in and, and help you understand some things that maybe are, are not something that you're familiar with. So that's my cell. Use it to, to discuss things with me. And, and no, my wife didn't divorce me because I took the calls from the bank. We, we handled the bank and, and we took care of it. And we'll do that uh, for you just as well. Um, that's all I've got. I wanted to leave at least a minute or two in case somebody had inspections or questions, excuse me. So, Bill, we do have a couple of questions in the chat, um, and one of them you already answered. Uh, is it okay for a second floor porch or deck to be cement? Um, th there are situations where it's constructed correctly. So generally when I see that it's a roof, um, it was poured on top of um, cement block with reinforcing. Um, it's okay as long as it's properly supported. The, the biggest issue for that is trying to figure out um, what, uh, how they sealed it to keep water from, you know, depending on what's below it. If there's a room below it, then the, the challenge is the roofing product that's gonna protect it from, from having moisture because 
concrete is hygroscopic, it, uh, moisture will pass through it. But it's okay if it's properly supported. It seems like to be a general theme, you have these different ways of uh, using materials. It's gotta be used the right way, right? Yep. Um, Cause I, it's funny, I saw this old house and they were doing that, they were installing that green board system and I, they were using rollers. <laughs> hey. um, one other question in here I thought we were legally responsible to provide the seller with a copy of the inspection report you are but I can't provide it so the the, the, the if we're working for the buyer it's inherently um, uh, in our contract and in our scan, scope, uh, scan, standard of practice, that, that only information only goes to you as the buyer and the buyer's agent. Um, if the if the seller wants a copy of it, they are absolutely entitled to it. We just won't give it to them. You're, they're going to have to get it through you because we never want that. We would never want the seller to see the the home inspection report before the buyer. We want to give you all the opportunity to couch the information, to figure out how you want to present it to them, and then you deliver it on your time frame. So yes, they are absolutely entitled, but it's not coming from us. Would you always recommend removing all knob and tube? More than likely, yes. There are a few cases where it's just serving lighting fixtures um, and not the outlets, which is really the biggest concern. But uh, the problem is that a lot of the insurance companies have moved away from it now. It's run its course. Um, you know, you're talking about a, a wiring product that's now nearly 100 years old in most cases. The insulation's falling off, um, and and really bad things were done to knob and tube um, over the years. So yeah, generally speaking, yeah, we're going to tell you you got to get rid of the knob and tube. How do you handle a situation when the inspector missed something like a cracked soil line? We always want to give the inspector an opportunity to, to deal with this, right? We literally say in the beginning of our inspection, if anybody says the home inspector, can't believe your home inspector didn't dot, 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 stop everything, call us. We want to be involved in the conversation. But if he missed it, depending on what was the situation, we had one that we missed um, up in Pottstown. And it was when I went back and looked at the pictures, you literally couldn't enter the basement. There was so much stuff in the basement. All you could do is walk down to the bottom of the steps and do a 360. That soil line was buried. Uh, I can't really be held accountable for that. Now, we did step up and help that guy a little bit to, to figure out a solution because a good home inspector is going to understand that for every call that I get about a problem, you're getting three as the agent, right? You recommended them, you know, this is your inspector and this is ridiculous. But generally speaking, if, if it was readily visible and they missed it, they should step up. We all have insurance. We're required by the state of Pennsylvania to carry insurance. Um, uh, I believe the, the minimum is 100,000. We carry a couple million. Never have seen, uh, to be clear, never been, I've never been sued, never tapped my insurance company. We've always stepped up and tried to help and a good inspector is gonna do the same. Um, so you should always contact the inspector first and give them the opportunity to go back and look at it. If they're blowing you off, then do what you gotta do. And I think, you know, if it was legitimately visible, um, they should be responsible for it. Some new construction and newly renovated homes have horizontal iron balusters. Is this incorrect for the structure uh, for the railings and balusters? Not, yes, it, and it's rampant. It's it's hugely um, a Philadelphia thing. We don't see this anywhere else really out, outside of Philly. Um, I, and I don't know what it is. It's not structurally a problem. It's just that we're worried about little kids climbing up like a ladder getting to the top of the railing and then falling down it's it's that's purely the, it's not a structural thing it's just a safety thing and, and it's not allowed anywhere else but it but for whatever reason it's hugely popular in, in philly so just just understand the limitations of it if you've got kids then you may want to um you may want to deal with that but like i said you can use zip ties or wire ties to fasten some some plexiglass on there temporarily to keep them from being able to climb it. All right, this is the last question we have here. Have lead issues increased today? Are you, so I guess, are we seeing an increase in that or not so much? <clears throat> well, not an increase. Now, Norristown Borough just implemented a requirement that yeah. you have to have um, lead dust testing done, which is going to increase the lead, ex the lead reaction in, in, in pocket areas. Now, I don't know if other places like Philly are going to pick up on that and, and go with that. Um, 
but I would say no, that generally speaking, lead hit its hit its zenith back in the mid 80s where everybody was going crazy. Like you got to strip all the lead out of a house. And then they realized they were actually doing more damage um, by creating all this lead dust, trying to remove it. So nowadays we just want to keep it in good condition, keep it painted. Um, but you know, to, to, to the answer to the question, if, if the boroughs and townships start increasing their lead testing requirement, yes, we will then start to see more. We're already seeing it in Norristown where now the, the lead dust testing or lead testing is required as part of a real estate transaction. Um, and so, you know, but the, but the reality is that lead is not as big, a, it's a problem for small children below six, right? So that's the deal. Any, any kid brain development um, before six is where lead contamination can, can affect the kid's cognitive future. Um, but the, uh, uh, but generally speaking, we just want you to keep paint in good condition, keep it cleaned up. All right, so let's finish on a high note here. We got some awesome comments in here, Bill. Um, this was exactly what I was looking for. Thank you for conducting this training. Thank you for the great Zoom meeting. And then we have a testimonial here. I'm not sure how much you're paying Paul, but he <laughs> said, <laughs> I feel I've used your company for years and your inspectors are professional in my opinion. Excellent presentation. So Bill, thank you so much. Awesome, awesome presentation. Thank you to all of our GPAR members for joining us today. This is really great, um, insightful stuff. And um, you know, we'll, we're not gonna let Bill go. We're gonna get him back in here sometime further down the road um, because there's always new things that he's learning as well as you guys are learning new stuff out in the field. So it's one of those things where uh, we'll see what's happening um, and give another opportunity to have Bill join all of us uh, a bunch of months down the road. Um, but until then, thank you all. Have a great week, have a great end of the week. And uh, remember, Philly Home Show tickets. Come and yeah. get them. Thank Go you. Get them. Have a great spring market, guys.